We can do both, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, my name is Stefan Wellen, uh, and uh, I work at the European Commission office here in Copenhagen. And together with my colleague, Torbjörn Larsson, I will today um, go through some of the EU funding uh, opportunities there are for green initiatives um, helping with the green transition. Um, after a short introduction, my colleague Torbjörn will go through the uh, European Recovery and Resilience Facility, one of the key uh, instruments or key uh, parts of the recovery package agreed by the EU leaders at the summit in July. Uh, after that, I will give an overview of some of the other key uh, funding sources available for green initiatives. Um, the purpose is not to give the full picture of absolutely everything which is out there, because that would take a few days, but it's more to give you a flavor uh, of the things that are there and to point you in the right direction where you can get more information. Uh, I still would like to now, in the introduction, just mention one instrument that I will not go into in detail. That is uh, Horizon Europe, which is the main uh, research instrument. Um, this is uh, a quite complex instrument, so I will not go into that here, because that would take too much time. But um, it also has uh, green elements in there. It has clusters around um, climate, energy, and mobility. Um, and anybody who comes from the research uh, perspective should have that in mind and probably do already. Um, but after I have um, gone through these funding sources, I will also give a few tips to those of you who are ready to actually apply for them. Uh, and these tips are, are purely from myself based on going through hundreds of these applications over the years and knowing which are the more common mistakes, etc. So, um, why uh, do we now have this situation with the European Green Deal? I mean, in Denmark, you have a very ambitious uh, green policy at the moment with the, seven the target of 70% reduction for 2030. But Denmark is not alone. I mean, this is part of a global trend um, and very much part of what's happening in Europe. Environmental policy has been part of uh, the European agenda for a long time. I mean, we've had important pieces of legislation like uh, the Habitats Directive or the uh, fr uh, Water Framework Directive or the REACH Directive for chemicals. But this, I mean, European environmental policy has been kind of one policy out there on its own with no impact on the overall agenda. This is all different now because now all the green initiatives um, is really part, the key part of the agenda. So there are a number of initiatives that have been taken since the new commission um, came into office last year. Uh, and not only are these initiatives really a key part of what we want to do, but the green issues are also integrated in the other policy areas. So you can really see that now um, environment and climate is at the center of European policymaking. And why is that? It is basically because of the science and the facts. We have he heard all the reports from the UN Climate Change Panel and seen the, the dire consequences that would be the result if we do not manage to get down the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, there are other policy areas which do, maybe do not get the same attention as climate, but I mean, in terms of biodiversity, you have um, for wildlife, the population has uh, diminished by 60 or 70 percent since 1970. Um, and you have one million species threatened with extinction. In terms of the very important uh, circular economy agenda, um, we are using the planet's resources in a completely unsustainable way. I mean, just to give one example, um, China, during the three years, 2011 to 2013, used more cement 
than the US did in the whole of the 20th century. And this obviously cannot go on. So, with this new uh, awareness of the challenges in the environmental and climate field, um, there will also come a demand, a demand for sustainable solutions. And this is where there is a role for Denmark. Danish companies have a very strong position in many of these areas, where they've seen renewable energy, clean water technology, or uh, resource-efficient solutions. Um, if Denmark fully embraces this uh, change and, 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 and tackles it head on, then, uh, as we know, the first movers will have a competitive advantage, and Denmark will uh, have a big part of this uh, green growth and create many green jobs. So after this introduction, I will now give the uh, word to my colleague Torbjörn, who will talk about the recovery and uh, resilience facility. Oh, thank you. My name is Torbjörn Olauson. I've been working as a European semester officer uh, at the Commission representation here in Copenhagen since 2014, and now um, since a couple of weeks back, working with the recovery and resi resilience facility. This facility is quite new. It didn't exist a few months ago. It's a new invention that, it ca that came up as part of to resolve well, some of the challenges that we have that also Stefan has been alluding to. First of all, among these challenges, I would like to, to first mention the energy and climate challenges. Well, these are quite, these are not exactly small, uh, but developments, recent developments, but also the Paris Agreement has basically focused the minds of the leaders that we need to resolve this issue now and quite rapidly. Uh, the Commission want, or at least have tabled a proposal to uh, reduce CO2 emissions by 55% by in 10 years. You know, well, Stefan mentioned as well, Denmark want to reduce to the 70% on Denmark alone. The European Parliament want to reduce it by 60%. And we'll see where we land, but at least we would like to reduce it by 55%. And that requires quite significant investment in many member states. We also have the challenge of energy sourcing independence. I mean, not all member states are blessed, as Denmark is, with wind and the waves and so forth. Many member states, for example, in Eastern Europe, are dependent on coal, gas, and other fossil fuels. Not only do they source it from the ground, but they also source it from a, well, shaky, can I say that, in the, uh, neighbor to the east. There's also significant energy efficiency potential. Not only last week, the Commission tabled its National Energy and Climate Plan, where the Commission recommended to Denmark that there is a huge potential to save much more, save energy by uh, investing in, for example, buildings. The other challenge I'd like to mention here is, of course, a digital transformation. Of course, here we see global competition among, among uh, between member states and between member states as collectively and China and US about dominance and new technology, but there is also a huge potential here in terms of productivity, productivity growth, which has been a challenge for Denmark for some years. And lastly, as somebody said, don't waste a good crisis. I don't know if it's a good crisis, but at least the pandemic has triggered the commission into do something extra. Normally, every seven years, we table a so-called seven-year budget approximately 1.1% of GDP. As you know, it goes about 40% of agriculture. But this time around, we said, okay, we got to do something else. We have to invest now for the future. So what the Commission did was to, okay, in addition to the 1,1% in a common budget, we're going to see if we can fund by borrowing up on the market and invest here and now some 750 billion euro. And this is what they call the next generation EU. And this consists to approximately 85 or 90% the recovery and resili resilient facility of 672 billion euro. That's quite a significant amount.
You will, of course, have noted the economy this year was not what we expected to be at the beginning of this year. We have had a so-called V-shaped economy with a huge dip in April, coming back a bit over the summer, but now we are in, again in a bit shaky ground. And this is why we already in May proposed this so-called Next Generation EU, which then is the name of the 750 billion euro uh, borrowing that we're going we're gonna to buy. Uh, the, the, we expect when this is then put on the market, that this fund is put on the market, and we can invest this money, we expect this to contribute approximately by 2% in addition to the GDP and create up to 2 million jobs. We hope, because this is very much in the workings, this is very much in the, in the, uh, in the discussion between the Council, I mean the Member States Forum, the Parliament and the Commission. So there's a discussion as we speak, but we still hope that this will be operational by the 1st of January, in other words, in, two, in about uh, nine weeks from now, and that the funds can start with, to be distributed by approximately mid-summer next year. I should add that in the circle there, you will see that from beginning, we thought that this, most of it should be grants. After compromise in between member states, we have a division between grants and loans. So grants which are then paid to member states without to be repaid, and loans which then can member state can apply for, but which should then be reimbursed back to the, back to the commission uh, over the 30-year period. Now, coming to the nitty-gritty, uh, as I said, this is very much in the, in, 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 the, in the making, but the current plan is that uh, the member states should submit a so-called national plan, national recovery and resilience plan. Uh, and this is all set out in what we call the Commission's 2021 as Annual Sustainable Growth Strategy. We have there also submitted a guidance and a template to member states. So we will work with the 27 member states. Each when a member state should have a contact point. And it's up to, mem up to that member state to submit the plan to us. Uh, the drafts can be already be submitted. In fact, many, many of the Euro member states have already submitted a draft plan as of the, as of the 15th of October. Some of you may know that member states that are members of the Eurozone should submit the budget to the Commission by that date. So they have done, done those in parallel. Uh, Denmark and Sweden and some other member states not membering the Euro, they will wait a bit more. Uh, member states are audit discussing with us. In fact, us means a task force. We have set up a task force inside the Commission to work with and to evaluate these national plans and to work with the member states and to assess how the disbursement will be carried out. And I am personally then being a member of this, of this task force then, but sitting then here in Denmark. Uh, when these plans are submitted to the commission, which the deadline is by the end of April, so in other words, you have from now until April to submit the plan, they then should tally uh, with the so-called so uh, country-specific recommendations, which have been issued uh, in the context of UP semester. They should tally with the national reform program, which was submitted by member states by the end of April. And they should also tally with the recommendation that the Commission issued uh, just uh, last week uh, on the national energy and climate plans. And we will then closely monitor the member states' performance uh, once they have submitted and once we have given the green light to uh, and report back to Member States and European Parliament. The objectives, well, I will enter into the three, ob three main objectives, three group of objectives. First of all, and what is most relevant in this, in this context, of course, is supporting the green transition. In fact, we have said that the money dispersed through the MFF, the, nom the normal budget, and, the, and, the, and this fund, the Resilience and Recovery Facility, should be 30%. And this makes it, this triggers 
that this facility alone should have at least 37% green targeting. This, I don't think, will be a challenge for Denmark, but it might be for some member states, will be very interesting to see. But we will set up indicators for this to make sure that each member state in the national plans will reach these objectives. We also have the so-called significant harm principle, which is inherited from the uh, taxonomy regulation on green, uh, green funding. In other words, that all expenditures paid out from this money should follow the do no harm principle. But you can see there from the list, the aim is to carbonize the industry, circular economy, biodiversity, and sustainable mobility. We also have some flagship schemes, which I will come to the last. Objectives in the second group will be the digital, improved connectivity, digital skills, cutting edge technologies, cybersecurity, and 20% of the funding seeked under this national plan will have to be have some green uh, digital uh, di digital uh, expenditures. Well, cost associated with, with digital. Some expenditures may, for example, click the box both under the climate and digital if they so wish. And the third group of the objectives here will be the strengthening social and economic resilience. And I wish there uh, to recall that the Commission has recently uh, both at the previous commission and also recent commission, highlighted the importance of this of the social agenda. For example, the pillar of social rights and the introduction of sustainable development goals within European semester. My last page here will be flagship areas for investment and reforms, which the commission encourages the member states to uh, to seek funds under. And you can see there that some are digital and some are climate ones. We're very much looking forward to clean technologies, like the ones we had just heard about in the last session there, energy efficiency, like the one I just alluded to in the, climate, in the energy climate plans, recharge and refuel, then of course, uh, connect broadband services, uh, digitalization of public administrations, scale up, and then, of course, the skills. Of course, some of these are more relevant to Denmark than others, uh, but it's up to Denmark to pick and choose what is most relevant for Denmark. So we very much look forward to uh, Denmark submitting this plan. But the, again, if you are a fund seeker in Denmark, uh, you're not gonna seek the funds from us, but you seek it from the member state, from the Denmark Central Administration, and then Central Administration will then seek the funds from us. Stefan, I'll leave the word to you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, as Torbjörn said, the uh, recovery package was adopted in July, and along with that, the new MFF, the long-term budget. And over many years, one of the key uh, expenditure posts in the EU budget has been the investment and structural funds. And uh, they have not always been green. They have funded development in different parts of Europe. Uh, and uh, sometimes there have been some controversy because they have funded things which are not contributing to a, um, a green environment. But that has developed over the years. And even in the current period, not talking about the future, but even the current period, you have much more investments in new green technology, etc. cetera. Um, and as Torbjörn mentioned, uh, with this do no harm principle, I mean, for instance, we do not invest in anything that has to do with carbon. Um, we uh, are only going to invest in things uh, which are good for the uh, environment. And the structure funds um, is uh, managed through what is called shared management. In practice, that means that we, from the European level, we negotiate with the member state the programs, kind of the broad principles, what should you fund in your member state, uh, based on the specific conditions there, the specific issues they want to address. And then we monitor how it's being implemented. But the actual implementation and the pro project selection is done at the national level. So in Denmark, it would be the Danish business authority that is running 
um, the implementation of the program. For the 2021-27 period, so the, the next programming period, the programs are being negotiated now over the next few months. And we talk about programs like the Regional Development Program, which normally focus a lot on SME support, um, innovation, etc. Um, and the European Social Fund, which is much more linked to the labor market and things like reskilling, upskilling, etc. And a new element, which is also a part of the European Green Deal, is the Just Transition Fund which will deal with the um, social consequences of a rapid green transition. So, um, there are five overall policy objectives of the structural funds. Here I've highlighted the two first ones. So basically, a smarter Europe and a greener Europe. Because they, there will be a lot of focus on them in Denmark and they have both the uh, potential to really contribute to the green transition. Um, the first one, Smarter Europe. Because there is a, a focus on uh, smart specialization, that's to say that in this area we should actually um, fund and help the sectors where a country has a competitive advantage. In Denmark, that is very much the green sector. So there will be a strong focus on um, green innovation in policy area one. Policy area two is not so much the development of new technology, but actually implementing um, things which are already there in a way that the indicators for this policy objective is really about measuring improvements to the environment. As I just said, the program for the next period is actually being, implemented, or being negotiated as we speak, which means that it's impossible to say what will be in the Danish program. But based on information which is quite recent about the state of the negotiations, for me, it is quite likely that these are green areas that will have key, a key place in the Danish programs. So eco-innovation, as I mentioned, um, the Danish uh, Executive Board for uh, Business Development and Growth, they have uh, mapped which are the areas of strength for Denmark. And some of the key ones are like, uh, environmental technology, energy technology, uh, biotech technology, things which really very much are in the green agenda. And as um, the, every, everything you do under Policy Objective 1 should be focused on these areas of strength, there will be a very strong element of eco-innovation uh, in the Danish programs. Um, because Denmark, I mean, Denmark is uh, an innovation leader overall, but the problem in Denmark is that innovation is very much focused in a few companies. You have few big companies that does most of the innovation. You have very few SMEs that have um, product development of completely new products or completely new markets. Uh, and this is what the uh, funds probably will go in and support under the new uh, programming period. Under policy objective two, uh, I think it's very likely that Denmark will focus to a large extent on energy efficiency and circular economy. I mean, energy efficiency for the basic principle that the cleanest energy, which one is that? is the one that never needs to be produced. And if you can reduce energy um, demand by having more energy efficient housing, more energy efficient office, office buildings, industrial buildings or industrial processes, you will actually gain a lot. And it's a win-win situation because of course, these companies will not have to pay for the energy they don't use. Um, Circular economy, as I said, I think this is an area which will become more and more uh, central. And in Denmark, it is also very important that we look at this area because Denmark is actually the country uh, with the highest amount of waste, household waste per capita. So there is a need. Denmark is a, a very suitable kind of um, 
experimental laboratory to, to try new things in the area of circular economy because if it works in Denmark with such a high waste uh, output, uh, it will work most other places as well. And as an accompanying uh, measure, I think that the European Social Fund will very much focus on green skills and green jobs because if you move the industry from uh, the polluting sectors into uh, much more green industries, of course, there will be a different set of skills that is needed. And therefore, um, there is a need to reskill the labor that today works in the sectors which will not have such a prominent place in the economy of tomorrow. Then there is the Just Transition Fund. It was introduced as a part of the European Green Deal. The idea is that um, the cost of the a rapid green transition will be unevenly shared. And therefore, we need to have some mechanism to deal with that. If you take an example um, like Poland, where you have regions where you have very big coal mines, and if we on a European level insist that no, we have to get out of coal within a very short space of time, and you have a region where the only major employer is a huge coal mine, there are no other major employers within a radius of 100 kilometers, then of course there needs to be something done to, to um, diversify the economy. And this is where the Just Transition Fund come in. In the Danish context, it is less clear uh, exactly what the Just Transition Fund will do because we do not have regions in Denmark that are so overwhelmingly dependent on polluting industries. And especially, as I said, with the timing being what it is, this is something that will be negotiated over the next few months. And therefore, uh, today we cannot say what it will be used to. But it could be things like um, the polluting industries, rather than just trying to get out of the polluting industries, we could say that we could try to save the jobs in these industries by again uh, trying to green the processes to make them less polluting and keep the jobs by innovation. The next program I will talk about is the LIFE program. And the LIFE program is um, the oldest and, and, and for a long time the only major financing source uh, in terms of uh, economy, uh, in terms of environment and climate. Uh, since 1992, it has financed some 5,000 projects, I think, and very, very different type of projects. A lot has been done to finance the Natura 2000 network of uh, sites, habitat sites. Um, so LIFE is a key funding source for that. But then you also have uh, LIFE Environment, which funds uh, environmental technology. It funds uh, municipalities that want to find new ways to deal with waste. Uh, uh, over the last few years, you have different types of projects, which are called integrated projects, much more strategic, which are given to authorities to help them implement um, European legislation. For instance, you have an obligation to implement uh, waste management plans or river basin management plans. Huge, very, very costly uh, things to implement. And so therefore we say, okay, you can have money for these integrated projects, which will be kind of coordinated. I mean, I mean, we're talking about projects with tens of millions of euros just to set up the coordination mechanism because to implement these plans, it will cost hundreds of millions of euros. So um, there are many different types of projects on the LIFE program. Under the new period, 21 to 27, there will be four sub-programs, with one on nature that will continue to fund the Natura 2000 and uh, nature conservation, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem services, etc. There will be the uh, circular economy and quality of life sub-program, which is all other normal kind of environments, so all kinds of pollution and waste and circular economy. Um, and then there will be climate mitigation adaptation and the cl clean energy sub-programs, which both of them will um, contribute to the target of reducing CO2 emissions and also dealing with the effects of climate change in terms of climate change adaptation. As you can see in this slide, 
there's a very broad range of beneficiaries to the LIFE program where you have a third companies, a third public sector, and a third NGOs. NGOs is actually also like I say, another type of um, funding that is you give uh, operating grants to NGOs. So we want to have NGOs as partners in the policy process. When we develop environmental policy, we want to make sure that there are big European environmental NGOs that we can have as interlocutors because we know for a fact that we will get the opinions of the industry anyway. Industry have uh, the money to employ lobbyists, etc. So in order to make sure that we also get the other side of the argument, we provide operating funding through life to uh, European green NGOs to make sure that their arguments are heard as well. If we look at the traditional life projects, which is kind of the main uh, way uh, life works, this is really focusing on down-to-earth projects which will have a real environmental impact on the ground. And that could be the, the, the best practice projects for, for nature, where you really do a renovation of a site so that the habitat becomes uh, at a good, state, a good state again for, for a specific type of threatened species. But also in terms of the environment projects, you have demonstration projects. So life does not fund basic research, nor does it do real market penetration of, of mature technologies. It is the step in between. If you have something that has been proven on a small scale but want to demonstrate it actually works in practice, then life could be for you. I'll give you one example. I had a project that I was in the selection panel that selected that project. I was then the kind of monitor following that project during the lifetime. And that was environmental technology. It was set up as a company in 2009 to actually apply for this grant. And it proved so successful during the lifetime of the project that, that the company went on. And today, some 10, 11 years later, it employs 100 people, uh, has got financing from a number of different sources, hundreds of millions of kroners, and uh, has contracts with a large number of electronic manufacturers to, in, in, um, to include their technology in their product in order to uh, reduce the uh, use of energy. So, for a small company, this could be a really interesting uh, financing source in terms of developing te technology to become mature to the market. The last funding source that I will talk about in more detail um, is the Innovation Fund. It's actually quite an interesting instrument because it's funded through the uh, emission trading system. Mm -hmm. So basically the emission uh, rights that are bought by companies, some of that funds goes to the uh, Innovation Fund, which means that actually the emission trading system is, bo is both a, a stick and a carrot in terms of moving towards a more carbon neutral uh, economy. It's a stick because it costs money to actually emit these uh, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, and it's a carrot because if you as a company uh, try to invest in technology that would significantly reduce your emissions, you can get funding for that technology. Um, so it's different kinds of technology, both in terms of the uh, energy intensive industries in terms of renewable energy, uh, energy storage, which has been a big problem over the years. And of course, this carbon capture and usage or car carbon capture and storage, which we've heard so much about, but which is not today um, operational, mm. but which will need to become operational in some form if we are going to deal with the serious polluters which do not have any other technological way out today. Um, at the moment, there's actually the first call for proposal open, mm. although I doubt whether you would be able to put together a proposal between now and uh, next week when the closer of the call is, if you have not started already. But still, there will be regular calls under the Innovation Fund for the next uh, 10 years. Um, and I can say that the, the way they are selected, they will very much focus on the potential for reduction in uh, carbon emission on the, uh, they should be highly innovative projects, 
they should be mature in the way that you should have a clear business plan and a good organization. They should be scalable so they can have a, a real impact in terms, of the, um, in terms of the emissions. And they should be cost efficient as well. So, I've gone through a few uh, sources of funding just to give you an overview. And now I would just like to give you some um, advice uh, based on the, the applications I've seen over the years. Um, first, some very basic points. You have to know that there is um, competition for EU funds. Most of it is European-wide competition, although for some things like the uh, structural funds, there is a Danish pot of money that you apply for at the Danish uh, Business Authority. And there will also be a specific Danish port for the recovery and resilience facility, etc. So they don't compete on the European level, but still there is a significant competition. And it takes a lot of effort to put together um, an application. Because if you don't, then the quality is not there. And I have to say that that is very, very frustrating. When you sit and look at proposals, and the basic idea is really good, but they have just not put the effort in to put in a professional application. And that is very frustrating because these could be projects that could make a real difference on the ground, but because they do not have the expertise how to put together an application, they fail. And of course, if you don't apply, it's, it's certain that you cannot get any money. Um, so, the first step. What do you want to address? What is the problem that you want to address? And all through this, it is important that if you have the opportunity to quantify, do that. What is the problem? How bad is it? How big are the pollutants? If you are working in a, um, on a, a project in one city, so how much is that pollution in that city? How, how, how uh, big is the problem, etc.? Put it in context. Um, the sequence of actions should be clear. So what do you actually want to do about the problem? And where do you want to, to be at the end? Quantify again. Is there a clear line between problem, actions, and product? Again, quantify. Um, we do not want to waste this money. We do not want to put money for a limited period of time, and at the end of the project, it just fizzes out like that. There are no real long-term effects. Therefore, already from the time when you make the application for a project, you should be clear on how this should continue after the EU funding is gone. So you should have a long-term business plan. Clear description of uh, beneficiaries. Who does what? Some people think that, okay, we put together a project and we put in a lot of different actors so that it will seem that it's impressive um, kind of partnership. But we look at there should be a clear role. So if there is not a specific reason why a specific actor is involved, they should be taken out. Each actor should have a specific role in the project. And a practical thing at the end there, um, take into account that for many of these environmental projects, you would need permits. And if you don't take the timing of, of what, how long it takes to apply for a permit into account when you do the time plan, then you run into problems very quickly. So my basic message in terms of making these applications, have a clear intervention logic. What are you addressing? Who is involved? Who is doing what? What do you want to achieve? How are you going to achieve it? What's the timeline? There should be a clear link between um, what you do in terms of your work plan and how your budget looks like. There should be the same items in the two, etc. It might sound trivial, but I've seen so many cases where that's not the case. So these were just a few points um, based on my experience. I would like to, to, to give you the advice for as a potential applicants. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I just come in with two yes. comments, just yes, complementary things to what you just said? Or first of all, on the possible overlap between the recovery and resilience funds and the facility and the social and regional funds that we are. There is, of course, some overlap in terms of any efficiency, any, any defocus on all this. But of course, the timing is different here. 
uh, the, the purpose of the recovery resilience funds is to have a commitment at European level uh, for all the money by the end of 2023, and by member state level up to 2026. Whereas in the social fund, regional funds, you have up, up to 2027. So if you really want an investment now, here and there, it's very much on the RRF. But of course, that's your choice. You can, of course, apply from both applications, not for, for the same product, but not for the same cost. That's quite important. Then. In terms of uh, money allocated, I mean, of course, some, some funds, of course, are not there. You, have, don't have any, you don't have any national allocations. But for the social fund, the regional funds, you do have uh, national allocations. Uh, I don't know, you have yeah. the amount. At least for the RRF, the Resilience and Recovery Facility, you have, I think, something like 9.3 billion Danish kroner allocated for Denmark alone in grants. Yeah. That's quite a significant amount. Yeah, and for, and, and for the structural funds, overall, all the structural funds, the, the uh, amount is approximately half of that, so four and a half billion kroners overall for the seven-year period. Yeah. In terms of social fund and, and, and recovery, you have already a managing authority, you have a system built up for the recovery and solution facility. There is a build-up of the facility administration here in Denmark as we speak. Uh, I know which ministry is dealing with it, but it remains to be seen exactly which authority can they deal with it, but it can hopefully be clear in a few months' time. Okay. Thank you, Julian. So basically, here are just some, some links to where you can find more information, because this was just a taster, and um, you can go in and read a lot more about these different funding instruments and others. There are links there to others as well. Uh, and in the end, if you are ready to apply, for the ones which are managed at the European level, you can go into the uh, EU funding and tenders portal, where all of these, is, there's a one-stop shop to go in and look for them. Um, but for the ones managed at national level, of course, it's the national authorities which are listed here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.